Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Michael Honigberg. I am a graduating third year clinical and research fellow in cardiology and incoming member of the cardiology staff at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I'm thrilled to be with you this morning to talk about sex and gender differences in cardiovascular disease with a focus on unique risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women. Uh, I have no industry relationships or conflicts of interest. To, uh, this morning, I'm going to start with a brief overview of sex differences in cardiovascular disease to set the stage for some of the presentations that follow me later today. I'll, else, I'll then spend the bulk of my time on two sex-specific risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and premature menopause. I'll conclude with a discussion of implications for the prevention of cardiovascular disease in women. A quick note on terminology before we start. Uh, the terms sex and gender are often used interchangeably, and this can get confusing. When we refer to sex differences, strictly speaking, we're talking about innate biological differences that are driven by differences in gene expression and, uh, and by extension differences in sex hormone expression and downstream pathways. Gender, by contrast, typically refers to the interactions between humans and the environments and the cultural environment. Uh, so that would encompass things like environmental exposures, lifestyle factors, diet, exercise, stress, uh, the impacts of sexism. Uh, in practice, it's very difficult to disentangle the, the different effects of sex versus gender and biology. And so we often talk about sex and gender differences together. Um, for the purposes of brevity in this talk, I'll be referring to sex differences as a shorthand for sex and gender differences. The last thing I want to emphasize before I begin is that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of both men and women in the US and globally. So with that, let's talk about some common sex differences between women and men. The most common form of cardiovascular disease is ischemic heart disease. And we know that in general, women are relatively protected against ischemic heart disease compared to men, um, at least until the menopausal transition. Women who develop ischemic heart disease tend to do so on average seven to 10 years later than their male counterparts. We know that this, of course, isn't always true. Younger women certainly can develop acute coronary syndromes, and that's the group that's most likely to be missed and overlooked on presentation. So it's important to consider the diagnosis even in somebody who doesn't fit the typical uh, demographic. But again, on average, women develop ischemic heart disease seven to 10 years later than men. Uh, and so by the time they've done that, they tend to have amassed a greater burden of comorbidities. So I'm showing here some recent data from my colleague, Dr. Amy Sarma, who will be speaking a little bit later this morning. And she meta-analyzed 10 uh, large cardiovascular outcome studies run by the thrombolysis and myocardial infarction or TIMI study group. And she compared uh, sex differences in outcomes in patients presenting with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So on top here, we have the unadjusted risk for major adverse cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality. And if you, if you look at these unadjusted or crude risks, you see that in fact, they actually look a little bit lower in men, which is to say that it looks like women do worse uh, after NSTEMI. However, when we further account for differences in baseline age and comorbidities, in fact, women do a little bit better on average. However, even among patients presenting with acute coronary syndromes, women are less likely to be referred for invasive coronary angiography. They are less likely to be revascularized. And perhaps most concerningly, they're, least li they're less likely to receive guideline-directed medical therapies such as antiplatelet drugs and statins. Now, this may partially be due to the fact that women are more likely than men to present with so-called myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, or MINOCA. Minoka is really a grab bag of several different diagnoses and processes, uh, and several of these processes are more common in women, uh, including spontaneous coronary artery dissection, coronary vasospasm, um, 
This Minoka also includes things like coronary embolism, plaque erosion, and uh, often Takotsubo or stress cardiomyopathy will be lumped into the Minoka category as well, although we know it is not a coronary process per se. Moving into the realm of stable ischemic heart disease, we know that women are more likely than men to have coronary microvascular dysfunction and microvascular angina. The risk factors for microvascular angina and conventional epicardial coronary artery disease are largely shared, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, etc. And we know that down the line, even in the absence of obstructive epicardial coronary disease. Moving now to sex differences in heart failure, we know that compared to men, women with heart failure tend to develop heart failure with fewer associated comorbidities and are less likely to have underlying ischemic heart disease in conjunction with their heart failure. Relatedly, women are more likely than men to develop heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF. Now, the reasons for this remain incompletely understood at present. They may be related to differences in sex hormones or other hormonal signaling. Uh, they may be related to sex differences in adaptation and response to things like hypertension, arterial stiffness, diabetes, and obesity. Work to understand these differences is ongoing. In the realm of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or HEF-REF, peripartum cardiomyopathy is a unique sex-specific form of heart failure. Uh, it's rare, uh, typically dilated cardiomyopathy that develops at the end of pregnancy and in the early postpartum period. And in the advanced heart failure population, uh, disparities in referral for mechanical circulatory support, referral for cardiac transplantation, and outcomes among patients uh, waitlisted for transplant are worse in women for reasons that, again, remain incompletely understood at present. Some recent data may provide some insight into some of the sex differences we've just reviewed in both ischemic heart disease and heart failure. So I'm showing here recent data combining four large US cohorts uh, and following women's blood pressure across the lifespan. And you can see that women demonstrate a steeper, more rapid rise in both systolic blood pressure and pulse pressure uh, beginning as early as the third decade of life, you know, earlier than I think uh, we previously appreciated. Uh, it's possible, for example, that this more rapid upslope in pulse pressure, which reflects uh, a, a steeper rise in arterial stiffness, may underlie, for example, women's greater predisposition to concentric hypertrophy and half path though I think both the causes and consequences of these differences require further investigation. Now I'll move on to talk about sex-specific risk factors in women, and I'll emphasize two risk factors in particular. First, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and then premature menopause. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, other sex-specific risk factors include polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, some would say that autoimmune disease, which is much more prevalent in women, also constitutes a sex-specific risk factor. But I've picked these two risk factors in particular because they've been recently incorporated and codified in our multi-society cardiovascular guidelines as risk-enhancing factors for cardiovascular disease. So starting with adverse pregnancy outcomes, this is a, a constellation of pregnancy-associated conditions um, that include the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, or HDP, I'll call them for short. Uh, these include gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome. And the HDP, along with gestational diabetes and preterm birth, have been independently shown in studies to confer a roughly twofold increase in future cardiovascular disease risk, specifically coronary artery disease and stroke. So the data for these associations are, are fairly robust, I would say. The data are a bit more mixed and less robust for, for pregnancy complications like small for gestational age, miscarriage, and placental abruption. I'm gonna hone in a little bit on the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, as this has been our group, uh, a major research focus of our group recently. 
So we used the UK Biobank, a large British cohort, to study women with and without a prior history of HDP. And we followed these women for the development of a diverse set of cardiovascular conditions. We found that women with prior HDP showed accelerated development of coronary artery disease, heart failure, and several forms of valvular heart disease. In addition, we found that women with prior HDP had elevated arterial stiffness compared to women without prior HDP. And so this constellation of findings suggests that women with HDP have a syndrome of accelerated pancardiovascular aging. This finding was then corroborated in more recent data from the Mayo Clinic using the Rochester Epidemiology Project, where the authors uh, recapitulated many of the associations we observed with cardiovascular events and outcomes, and further showed that women with prior HDP accumulate comorbidities and multimorbidity at a more rapid rate than women without HDP, again suggesting an, a syndrome of accelerated cardiovascular aging. So your next question might be, well, why do women with hypertension and pregnancy develop accelerated cardiovascular aging? And the simple answer is that we don't yet entirely know for sure, but we, we're starting to have some insights. For example, in our study and other studies, chronic hypertension appears to be a key mediator of cardiovascular disease risk in this population, uh, explaining anywhere from 50 to 80% of the excess cardiovascular risk seen in women with prior HDP. Additional observational data suggests, and this is from the Nurses Health Study, suggests that mitigation of postpartum weight gain and maintenance of a normal weight in women uh, may prevent or at least delay development of chronic hypertension in women affected by HDP. More recently, we've, we've taken a genetic approach to try to understand these relationships and the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease risk in women with HDP. So here we've, we've tested uh, the genetic predisposition of women to develop the list of cardiometabolic and cardiovascular risk factors shown here. And we've looked to see if a genetic predisposition to these traits influences a woman's risk of developing HDP. And it turns out that genetic predisposition to elevated systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and body mass index all predict development of HDP. So this is important and has several key implications. First, it suggests that blood pressure and body mass index elevation are probably causal for the development of HDP. And by extension, that working to reduce blood pressure and reduce BMI pre-pregnancy may in fact serve to prevent the development of HDP in reproductive age women. Uh, it also helps unify, I think, the epidemiology that we've observed over time that women with HDP have elevated risks of both hypertension and obesity throughout the entire life course. And these data suggest that it's because they have a genetic predisposition to develop those risk factors. So I'll now transition to talk a little bit about premature menopause, our other sex-specific risk factor uh, in women. It's been known for a while that women with early age of menopause face increased risks of both coronary artery disease and stroke. And I'm showing here data from uh, the largest recent meta-analysis to look at this. This is of approximately 300,000 women published last year. And you can see that with progressively earlier age of menopause, this study looked exclusively at age of natural menopause, that risk of both coronary artery disease and stroke increases. We again used the UK Biobank to study um, both natural and surgical premature menopause um, and look at a diverse set of cardiovascular outcomes uh, in women with natural and surgical premature menopause. We found that women with natural premature menopause had a 36% increase in developing cardiovascular disease compared to women without premature menopause and that women with surgical menopause had an 87% increase in cardiovascular disease risk. We recapitulated prior associations with coronary artery disease as shown on the prior slide, but also found associations with a diverse uh, array of cardiovascular conditions, including aortic stenosis and to a somewhat lesser extent, atrial fibrillation. And if you look, 
with progressively earlier age of menopause displayed here on the vertical axis, the risks of, all, of each of these cardiovascular conditions generally appears to increase. Separately, we found that women with a history of premature menopause experienced accelerated development of other conventional cardiovascular disease risk factors, specifically hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and type 2 diabetes. So what does all of this mean in terms of cardiovascular disease prevention in women? Well, as I alluded to earlier, recent guideline updates to the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association's cholesterol and prevention guidelines created this list of what are called risk-enhancing factors. And both adverse pregnancy outcomes and premature menopause, defined as occurring before age 40, are included in this list of risk-enhancing factors. So more concretely, the way clinicians are supposed to use these risk-enhancing factors is specifically in the population of patients who don't yet have established cardiovascular disease and are at so-called intermediate risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, defined as between 7.5% and 20% risk over 10 years. And this is routinely calculated using such calculators as the pooled cohort equations. An intermediate 10-year ASCVD risk plus the presence of one or more risk-enhancing factor, according to guidelines, should push clinicians to recommend primary prevention statins, uh, ideally in a shared decision-making discussion. So in order to know that a, a woman sitting in front of you has risk-enhancing factors, it's therefore critical that clinicians take a thorough reproductive history as part of a comprehensive cardiovascular risk assessment. And beyond, you know, simply decisions about statin prescribing, a history of either adverse pregnancy outcomes or premature menopause signals an opportunity for clinicians to recommend early and aggressive lifestyle modification, uh, so-called primordial prevention, prevention to prevent or at least delay the development of traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors like hypertension, or in patients who have cardiovascular disease risk factors already to mitigate those risk factors, so-called primary prevention. And that we and others are engaged in efforts to identify novel preventive and therapeutic strategies beyond the common sense things like diet, exercise, weight loss, um, and then common pharma pharmacotherapies. We're hoping to find new pathways, new molecular targets that might improve cardiovascular disease prevention in these populations. A quick note on hormone replacement therapy or menopausal hormone therapy as it's now routinely called because this comes up quite a bit. In women who experience premature menopause, menopause society guidelines advise that these women receive hormone replacement from the time of premature menopause until these women reach an average menopausal age. And the goal of this is primarily to preserve bone health and sexual function. Just to emphasize, there are no robust data that hormone replacement in any age group effectively prevents the development of cardiovascular disease. Um, this was a prior misconception um, and Clearly, the WISE studies and Women's Health Initiative studies showed, if anything, a possible signal for harm, especially in older women and women further out from menopause receiving hormone replacement. So there may be good reasons for these women to receive hormone replacement, either for treatment of menopausal symptoms or for some other reason, such as bone health in women with premature menopause, but to emphasize it is not for cardiovascular disease prevention. So in summary today, we talked about some common sex differences in cardiovascular disease presentation and outcomes. We talked about adverse pregnancy outcomes and premature menopause as sex-specific risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women. And we talked about implications for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, I hope this was uh, informative. I hope you learned something. Um, for those who are interested, I'd refer you to this updated recommendations document uh, for Primary Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease in Women, published just last week in the Journal of the College of, uh, the, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, it's an excellent document, extremely high yield. I thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions a little bit later this morning.